This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 874, recorded on March 10th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Weather's getting warmer. COVID's dropping, Daniel. You know, the weather's weather's working in our favor. Outdoors is a good thing, I think we've learned. So, um, you know, things are still moving in the right direction. Um, and a lot to cover again today. I um, I was looking through the comments, you know, last time I warned, I said, sorry, this is going to be a long episode. A few of the comments were like, Dan, your episodes are always long. Oh, that's <laughs> so, very nice. <laughs> so. So yes, appreciate the uh, the constructive criticism. Um, <laughs> let me start with a quotation: "If you will not fight for right when you can easily win without bloodshed, if you will not fight when your victory is sure and not too costly, you may come to the moment when you will have to fight with all the odds against you and only a precarious chance of survival. There may even be a worst case. You may have to fight when there is no hope of victory." And this is Winston Churchill. Um, and, you know, th this is by no means over. Um, and certainly nothing about this pandemic um, allows us the rights to claim any sort of victory. This has been um, a quite a defeat <clears throat> of humanity by this virus so far. Um, but I'll be talking a little bit about lessons learned because maybe we're maybe we're not going to uh, leave this pandemic without some lessons learned. So um, that'll be right near the end of this very long episode. Um, okay, <laughs> I will say um, that I'm in good moods. Num numbers are coming down, uh, less folks in the hospital. Um, even the number of uh, deaths is coming down or we're, we're not quite to a thousand deaths per day, but we're, we're heading in that direction. Um, but I did um, find a few um, articles uh, this last week, which were a little disturbing. So let's, let's talk about those. So the first is SARS-CoV-2 is associated with changes in brain structure in UK Biobank. Now, <clears throat> there's some great figures um, and, you know, this would be one of those articles that perhaps can be a deep dive on one of our um, other um, podcasts, like Twin, for for instance, because um, this does get complicated, rather sophisticated. But let me go through just sort of a high level. Um, here, the, the authors investigated brain changes in 785 UK biobank participants aged 51 to 81 um, that were imaged twice. Um, now, what was what was really exciting about this um, study was that they included 401 cases who tested positive for infection with SARS-CoV-2 between the two scans. So we have a baseline scan, we have a SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, and then we have a separate scan, and we have 384 controls. Um, so they identified significant longitudinal changes when comparing the two um, groups, including, and I go through these, one, a greater reduction in gray matter thickness and tissue contrast in the orbitofrontal cortex. So that's um, an area where there are extensive connections with sensory areas, as well as limbic structures involved in emotion and memory. Um, also the parahippocampal gyrus, again, memory encoding and retrieval, um, sort of consistent with some of the reports that we've been hearing from patients. Um, also, um, there were changes in regions functionally connected to the primary olfactory cortex. Uh, so just potentially another area where we're seeing damage, right? We've talked about the sustenacular cells sort of right up there in the olfactory mucosa, but maybe some changes here actually at the cortex level. Um, a greater reduction in global brain size. Um, and then consistent with other reports, the infected participants showed um, larger cognitive declines between these two time points. Um, so um, concerning impacts on the brain, um, we also, in open form infectious disease, had the manuscript New Onset Dementia Among Survivors of Pneumonia Associated with Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 Infection. Um, here, the investigators reported on 10,403 patients with pneumonia associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection 
3%, so about 1 in 30, developed new onset dementia um, basically over the next um, six months. Um, they adjusted, they looked at a number of co-founders, but um, this was consistent uh, throughout. So significantly higher um, chance of going on to develop dementia after SARS-CoV-2. So ra rather disturbing um, when we just think about how many people have been infected with SARS-CoV-2. Daniel, um, is there any relationship between the brain changes and severity of COVID? I, I, I wish I could say something reassuring. And actually what they did is they looked at, well, maybe just people who've been sick enough to be in the hospital. Let's compare them to people that didn't require hospitalization. They saw consistent differences in both populations. So um, yeah, concerning that even those folks that think of it as a, a milder um, form of uh, COVID not requiring hospitalization, um, they still were seeing these um, changes. So not good, not good. <clears throat> Um, I also wanted to briefly address something that really is kind of in our, our wheelhouse of, um, I'll say, medical communication. Um, and so COVID in Ukraine. Uh, maybe we have some, some fans of Guns, Germs, and Steel, the Jared Diamond book, um, which, which has some flaws. Um, it's open to criticism, too. Um, <laughs> But through a very successful disinformation campaign, vaccine confidence in Ukraine has been undermined. And according to the WHO, only about one third of the people in Ukraine are vaccinated. Um, so I, I see these, these pictures um, you know, of all these individuals. They're in these crowded shelters, um, subways, you know, sort of hiding from the bombs overhead. Um, you know, and, and everyone says, well, you know, you're, you're not thinking about COVID. Well, I am thinking about COVID. I'm thinking about tuberculosis. I'm thinking about infectious disease. Um, historically, wars have resulted in opportunities for the spread of infections. Um, and it's actually estimated that about a thousand Ukrainians are dying per week from COVID, um, with the greater than 700 reported COVID deaths per week felt to be a significant um, underestimation. So, um, you know, without speculation on where the funds for this misinformation campaign originated, um, there was a report out of a group that was put together at Stanford, um, and they came out with the Virality, Virality Project, V-I-R-A-L-I-T-Y, interesting, Virality Project. And so this was a group, um, Stanford Internet Observatory, the University of Washington Center for an Informed Public, the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab, Graphica, the National Conference on Citizenship, um, NYU Center for Social Media, Tandem School of Engineering. So a lot of people got together and they actually created a report, Memes, Magnets, and Microchips, Narrative Dynamics Around COVID-19 Vaccines. Um, and actually, this is a rather lengthy piece um, that goes into the misinformation, the disinformation, because this really was a conscious, targeted, um, malignant um, and they actually talk a bit about, um, you know, the methods that were used. They identify actors within the U.S. and foreign actors in China, Russia, and Iran. Um, really long detail, but really gives a lot of people a sense of where this campaign is being um, driven from and also um, a bit about the, the innocent question tactics that they use. So um, a challenge for us to try to provide um, reliable science in the face of this um, sort of well-financed mass disinformation campaign. All right. Children, COVID, and vulnerable populations. I think it's very clear now, unfortunately, children are at risk of COVID. Um, and I know everyone is done with COVID here in the U.S., um, but I have to say, to be honest, I felt physically sick when I looked at the numbers of pediatric deaths for the week ending March 3rd. Um, I was thinking that we would be coming down already at this point, but another 23 children die from COVID-19 um, that week. We're still averaging greater than three pediatric deaths per day here in the U.S. Two dozen children are dying a week from COVID-19. Um, the majority of the deaths have occurred in the last six months. So since the end of the summer, we've had an additional 500 pediatric COVID deaths. Um, and so I actually, Vince and I shared with you just those numbers where you could sort of see the cumulative child deaths. And um, it's, yeah, it's really yeah, I was disturbing. Look, I was looking at these numbers today and thinking, why would a state like Florida declare that 
you don't need to immunize kids when kids are dying. I just don't get it. Um, yeah, no, I, I have to say it's very disturbing. You look at, you know, a, a vaccine that's so incredibly safe, um, and maybe we'll even go into how safe it is. Um, and yeah, the idea that you would not protect our most vulnerable, um, you know, there's got to be some political advantage to that um, that agenda. But yeah, disturbing because the science is very clearly when you're making a decision, that decision um, to get a child vaccinated is a much safer decision than, as we've seen, um, about half of our kids under 18 have been infected um, with all that comes with that. Now we're looking potentially long term um, neurological damage, et cetera. So just just a tragedy. Um, and actually, that you mentioned that, um, just announced Wednesday, November 9th, Pfizer initiated a phase two, three study of their novel COVID-19 oral treatment in pediatric participants. Um, so this is Paxlovid or Nermatrelvir. Um, so this will be the EPIC PEDS um, trial, um, and they are going to evaluate the safety, pharmacokinetics, and efficacy of Pfizer's oral antiviral. Um, they're going to be doing um, a phase two, three open label multi-center single armed study in approximately 140 pediatric participants. I mean, they actually acknowledge right up front that, you know, this is a pressing need. Um, 11 million children under the age of 18 in the U.S. have already tested positive for COVID-19. Um, there's been more than 100,000 hospital admissions for these children. Um, and as I think we shared, we're, we're approaching 1,000 deaths um, with most of those just in the last six months. Um, so they're going to go ahead and um, hopefully we're going to get some information. There's going to be two different cohorts. Um, cohort one um, is going to be pediatric patients 12 um, and up. Uh, cohort two is actually going to be um, a second um, dosing strategy, so a, a lower dosing strategy. Um, this is going to be twice a day for five days. Um, and they actually did mention, too, you know, they are going to try to go down even lower to get us information about um, younger age groups. Um, so, you know, another potential option that we might have for our children. Um, but again, nothing is, um, you know, as good as the vaccinations here. All right. Um, testing. Never miss an opportunity to test. Uh, I think we need to remember that this is still out there. Um, one of the things I will comment about here is with the growing number of home tests, I'm getting lots of calls, calls on a regular basis, where people have tested at home, they're positive, they want guidance. This is not being entered into those prevalence estimates, right? When you see your map of how many new diagnoses per 100,000, we're getting a growing number of positives that are, so to speak, off the radar. So just sort of important for us to keep in mind the um, decreasing reliability of those um, status updates. All right, the pre-exposure period. Um, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, um, you know, masks, reducing exposures, spending time outdoors. Um, the MMWR early release, SARS-CoV-2 incidents in K through 12 school districts with mask required versus mask optional policies, Arkansas, August through October, 2021. Um, here, in, here in Arkansas, when they compared um, places that had universal mask requirements compared to those that did not. Um, those with universal mask requirements reported about a 23% lower incidence of COVID-19 among staff members and students. A um, couple comments here, 23%, that's not huge. Um, you know, I know a lot of parents are really concerned now that the masks have come off. Uh, a few comments, the sky is not falling. This is not our most powerful intervention. Um, with case numbers dropping, um, being in school now with a mask off with lower prevalence is safer than it probably was with a mask on back when we had really high prevalence. Um, but just, you know, a growing amount of data here. Um, masks have a benefit. It's not huge. Um, and we've talked a bit about that. So um, next, and I think this is really an interesting, um, and again, you know, I'm going to say, Vincent, we need to have a this week in genetics <laughs> um, because this was a, uh, this was actually, I mean, I don't know, I, I spent a little time um, 
uh, doing genetics research. So I felt comfortable with this paper, sort of brought back some bad memories. Um, the whole genome sequencing reveals host factors underlying critical COVID-19 uh, published in Nature. Um, and in this investigation, um, with a long list of authors, um, they performed whole genome sequencing in 7,491 critically ill cases and 48,400 controls. Can you just imagine the budget on this study with whole genome sequence of this like 57,000 um, patients? And they actually were able to identify several associations, um, including variants within genes involved in interferon signaling, leukocyte differentiation, blood type antigen secretor status, um, myeloid cell adhesion, and coagulation um, factor F8. Um, and then they actually go on to say that a lot of these variants are potentially druggable targets. Um, so the whole idea here is potentially you would be able to identify um, those people that are high risk of progressing to severe disease. So, because this comes up all the time, people I say, I don't understand, um, you know, 10 people get infected and then, you know, this one person gets really sick and these other people, you know, they, they do so much better. What, what is going on? And this is really getting at, um, really scientifically, um, it's the genetics. We really are finding a nice, um, number of mechanisms here, and the mechanisms are involved in these individuals having a failure to control viral replication, an increased tendency towards the pulmonary inflammation, and an enhanced tendency towards intravascular coagulation. Um, but it is, it's a, it's a fun paper. It's got the Manhattan plots. And then what's actually really great in this paper is they actually have these um, predicted structural consequences to the identified changes. So really a um, really a great um, paper to take a deep deep dive into. You know, with respect to this week in genetics, I hear that uh, Eric Lander has some time. Maybe he'd be interested. Oh, that would be great. That would be excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Does he actually have time? He's a busy well, he guy. Was, he was just fired by the White House, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I feel like we got a little close to politics on that one. So we'll stand back. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, don't invite him on the show. Um, all right. Active vaccination. <laughs> never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Um, reports that we may be getting closer with Novavax. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm positive. I know people are, are not always as positive as I am. You know, bucket full of sunshine over here, my nickname. Um, but there are certain people who are hesitant to get vaccinated with what are perceived to be newer technology vaccines. And the Novavax is this traditional protein based, just like your shingle shot, just like some of our other shots that we've had for many, many years. Um, they've resolved their manufacturing issues. Um, there may be some new data required to be submitted from Mexico, we'll see. Um, but the, the current estimate is that um, May is when we'll have this as another option. Um, and remember, vaccines, um, you know, you need, you need a little time. This isn't like a mask that you can put right on. This isn't just like that decision not to go to that crowded restaurant. Um, you know, you got to get vaccinated. You got to get your first shot. You got to get your second shot. Maybe you're getting a third shot. Um, and so you got to start kind of moving in this direction because we are expecting numbers to increase uh, come next winter when this settles into more of a seasonal pattern. So hopefully this spring we'll have another option out there. Um, Evu Sheld. I'm going to talk a little bit about Evu Sheld here, but I'm also going to mention a little bit later. Um, a little venting here. I'm going to vent, Vincent. Um, mm -hmm. Roughly 80% of the available doses of Evu Sheld are sitting unused in warehouses on pharmacy and hospital shelves. Um, what's going on? Many patients and providers are not aware of this option. Um, the states are not ordering their doses of the 1.7 million doses um, that have already been paid for, purchased, and ready for distribution. Only 370,000 doses have been ordered by the states. Um, and there's also, there's bureaucracy here. Um, I'll say our organization, which is becoming Optum Tri-State, thousands of providers, um, we're trying to get access so we can give this to our patients in the comfort of the offices, um, provided by trusted um, providers, clinicians that they have relationships with. Um, a couple of our oncology groups have their um, administrative folks working on this. Uh, we have yet to get access to this drug, so we're still reliant on our partner organizations to access this therapy for our patients. So um, we need to do better for those immunocompromised folks who can't get the benefit of 
active vaccination to provide them with this passive vaccine option. The period of detectable viral replication. Um, this is when you test positive. You know, the time for monitoring monoclonals, antivirals, enrollment in clinical trials. Um, there is a little bit of a political aspect here. We may be running out of money to provide these treatments for, well, for free, paid for by the government. Unless something changes here in the U.S., the current supply of monoclonals will run out by May. Um, stocks of oral antivirals will also be depleted. Um, we might have enough to last us till September. Um, my fingers are crossed that they'll work out um, things down there in D.C. and get um, funding for this. But here we are in, I'm going to say, another encouraging, reassuring paper, efficacy of antiviral agents against the SARS-CoV-2 Omicron subvariant BA2. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this as the stealth variant. Um, this has been increasing across the country. Um, here in the U.S., greater than 10% of cases. You go a little bit northeast of us, it's you know quarter of all cases right here in New York. Um, it's clearly above 10%. West Coast, et cetera. So um, most of our country, this is actually becoming an issue. Um, they did report in this correspondence published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, that susceptibilities to remdesivir, malnupiravir, nermatrelvir, um, so all our direct acting antivirals were similar to those of the ancestral, um, they say strain, I'm going to say variant, and other variants of concern. Um, but some, several, as we've talked about, of the therapeutic monoclonal antibodies had lower neutralizing activity against Omicron BA2. Um, but reassuring that silgavimab, that's one of the two monoclonals in Evusheld, um, actually looked really good. Um, but they also um, did show that there might be some impact on sotrovimab. Um, all right, so let's go through. Number one choice, person test positive. You ask the question, are you high risk? Are you going to be eligible for therapy? It's a sore point for a lot of people because no one is at low risk of long COVID, um, but we really have not reached beyond that high risk group for hospitalization and death yet. Um, Paxlovid, the supply relative to demand is improving. Um, so I have to say, you know, speaking in our immediate area, we tend to be doing well, but I know some of my colleagues across the country are struggling to get access for their patients. Um, there's an educational component um, that is standing in the way here as well. Next option is monoclonal therapy, right? So as I was starting to mention in the U.S., the BA2, the stealth variant of Omicron, has reached more than 10%. Um, and this calls into question the efficacy of Sotravimab. Um, and we've discussed conflicting data um, out of Columbia, NYU, and now what I just discussed suggesting that there may be some negative impact on Sotravimab, um, but some data from GSK where they felt like there still was continued efficacy. Um, here, um, I'm going to say Connecticut and northeast of us, about 24% BA2. Region 2, that's here, New York, New Jersey, 17%. Um, we have a good supply of bebtilovimab. Um, and I think we're all in agreement that this remains um, effective. Um, but there's a couple little things here. One, I'm going to say the EUA requires that we are in the first seven days, not 10. Um, I have to say, I think that makes sense for all the monoclonals. Once you get out to day eight, nine, and 10, I'm not sure you're getting much benefit. It's really that first uh, five to seven days. Really, the first three to five is the most effective, as we've seen. Um, but I have to say, at least locally today, I was communicating with Stefan Mulbauer. He's another MD, PhD. He's head of the ER over at St. Francis, one of the Catholic health system hospitals. Um, and they, they and he have been a great partner over the last two years. Um, and what we do is for our patients, uh, preferentially, they just get Beb Um And the dosing of Beb Tolovimab is a little bit interesting. It's by short IV push. So let me go through Beb Tolovimab. So the dose, and this is for high risk adults, um, 18 years and older, or pediatric patients um, 12 years um, of age and older, got away at least 40 kilograms, um, 175 milligrams, it's intravenous injection over 30 seconds or more. So it goes in pretty quick. These aren't those 20, 30 minute infusions anymore. Um, you want to give it within those seven days, as I mentioned, um, and it's very easy to work with. It sits in the refrigerator. Um, it's two milliliters in a vial. It comes out. 
20 minutes to get to room temperature, and then you go and give those two milliliters IV. So um, a little bit easier to get it there. You still have to keep an eye on them and make sure they tolerate it. Uh, remdesivir is our next option, um, a little bit um, more challenging, right? That three-day IV, 200 up front, and then 100, 100, um, and then malnupiravir. Uh, you know, I'll say it's it's at the bottom of the list, um, but it's a nice option, right? We don't have to worry about kidney function. We don't have to worry about drug interactions and still about a 30% reduction in progression. Next, we've, we've sort of failed a little bit. The person has moved into that early inflammatory phase. No big changes here. Um, still steroids at the right time in the right patient. Anticoagulation at the right dose in the right patient if they end up in the hospital pulmonary support, maybe escalation to more immunomodulation. Now we will move to the tail phase, um, long COVID, post COVID. Um, and at first I wanna start off with discharge, right? So the patients ended up in the hospital. Now it's time to send them home. Um, what do we do? What do we do at that point? Now, most people don't end up in the hospital for, for those they do. Um, what do we do about steroids? So we've, getting, we've gotten, I'll say, a little bit better about trying to get these folks home a little quicker. Maybe if they're on remdesivir for five days, after day three, we might finish that off at home. We might provide oxygen in the home. Um, but a lot of folks are actually quite better at discharge. They're off oxygen. Um, do we continue those steroids? That's a big question, right? So we've already said, according to the most of the guidelines, we go ahead and stop anticoagulation unless there are compelling reasons. But the study association between dexamethasone treatment after hospital discharge for patients with COVID-19 infection and rates of hospital readmission and mortality was published in JAMA. Um, and they reported in a cohort of 1,164 patients with COVID-19 who received less than 10 days of dexamethasone, right? So they're getting six milligrams per day. Now it's time to discharge them. Um, and they compared those that were discharged to finish off versus those that just stopped when they left the hospital. They found no significant difference as far as rates of readmission, mortality, or really much else. So this is really in line with what a lot of us are doing. If the person gets better quick and they're able to get out of the hospital early, um, in most cases, we're stopping anticoagulation, we're stopping steroids, we're sending them on their way. Now, I have to say, Vincent, I was envisioned this would be the growing part of our episodes as we had, you know, trials to get people into and all these um, different um, treatment options for, for this growing group of folks suffering from long COVID. Um, but I think we're still kind of at the phase, unfortunately, where people are really resistant to the fact that this exists. People don't want this to be true. Um, and so we're still getting papers confirming that this is a thing. So the paper, Post-Acute Symptoms, New Onset Diagnosis and Health Problems 6 to 12 Months After SARS-CoV-2 Infection, a nationwide questionnaire study in the adult Danish population, um, was recently posted as a preprint. Um, as you can see, I'm getting away a little bit from the preprints. Um, so this is actually one of the largest studies. Um, and this is in line with a prior publication we've talked about, risk of clinical sequelae after the acute phase of SARS-CoV-2 infection, retrospective cohort study published in the BMJ by some of my colleagues at UHG and Optum Labs. Um, and in this preprint that was posted, the researchers did a nationwide cross-section study, including 152,880 individuals aged 15 years of older, um, with PCR confirmed SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then they actually compared this to a um, test negative control group, 91,878. Um, data was collected at six, nine, and 12 months. Um, at six to 12 months after the test date, one third, so about 30% of the test positive experienced at least one physical post-acute symptom. Um, we had dysosmia, so things are not smelling right. We had dysgeisia, things are not tasting right. Fatigue, exhaustion, dyspnea, trouble breathing, reduced strength in arms and legs. Um, and more than half of the test positives reported at least one of the following, I mean, sort of cognitive issues, concentration difficulties, memory issues, sleep problems, mental or physical exhaustion. Um, really seeing a lot of um, continuing evidence that this that this is a thing, I will say. So 
Daniel, right. what do you what do you think about these questionnaires? Can't we have diagnostic tests for long COVID that would be more solid data? I know I understand this, but a lot of people have similar issues, but it's not long COVID, right? Yeah, I, I, you know, Vincent, I think we need that. We need it for several reasons. We we do need some objective tests to um, assist these people. Um, to identify, to confirm um, that it's, you know, not in their head because there still is a lot of dismissiveness. Um, that was nice about the study we talked about last week where there were actually biopsy confirmed um, changes. Um, now we're seeing the imaging confirmed changes, um, but it's challenging because not a lot of people don't have a baseline imaging that we can then say, oh, look, we've seen this reduction. Um, but we do. We need some sort of objective. We, we need to move past questionnaires um, because it's true. When I try to help these people and I get on the phone with a disability person, they say, well, they're just telling you this. Maybe they're just, you know, not being honest with you. Do you have anything objective to support their story? Um, yeah, we, we, need, we need that, actually. That's really critical. It's even critical, I think, for the studies. If we can identify something objective, we can make yes. sure we're studying the right populations. Exactly right. Like if we had, this may not be it, but cytokine levels, you know, ratios or something that you could say, ah, this is long COVID, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. The rest of the world, no one is safe until everyone is safe. A um, couple bits of, I'll say, good news here. There are plans for a Moderna mRNA vaccine factory in Kenya. Um, we also heard that six African countries will start producing COVID mRNA vaccines as part of a WHO technology sharing program. And then I am going to close this out with um, a new section. I'm adding a new section, Lessons Learned. Um, and this I thought was an exciting um, last week. The Global Pandemic Preparedness Summit um, was held in London, um, and it was March 7th and 8th. Um, and at the end of this meeting, there was a pledge. They concluded with a pledge to provide $1.535 billion to CEPI. Um, and CEPI is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. Um, their scientific advisory committee is really a who's who in the field. Um, and I can recommend TWIV 612, um, where Vincent spoke with Richard Hatchett, the CEO of CEPI. Um, just look look through, like go to this website, go to sepi.net and just look at all the people, tremendous people that are involved in this effort. And this really goes back to my Churchill um, comment. This pandemic has been devastating um, in terms of loss of human life, devastating in terms of economics, um, really devastating in so many levels, even beyond just the direct impacts of COVID, the direct impact on global and all kinds of other health um, systems throughout the world. This is putting, you know, a, an ounce of prevention um, in front of those tw trillions of dollars of cure that we had to bring by not being um, prepared. So really, um, really positive, I have to say, to hear this news. Um, and as I close, as this drops, or so we're recording Thursday night, this will drop um, maybe on Saturday morning. It's all up to Vincent. Um, so one thing, um, when it drops, it's going to drop on the 12th of March. But the 11th, so that's tomorrow after we're recording this, um, that was one year, two years, two years after this was acknowledged officially as a pandemic. Um, so really, um, really a tough last two years. Um, when a lot of people listen, I'm going to be on a plane headed down to Panama, where I'm going to be headed out to a remote community to provide medical care in a um, mobile clinic that we will set up in this community. And when we record our TWIV next week, um, I will share my experience down there. I'll share my experience about the pandemic's impact on this very limited resource region. Um, so at this point, I want everyone to pause their recording. I want them to go to parasiteswithoutborders.com, um, click the donate button, um, every small amount helps us to continue doing what we're going to do. Um, and we're going to be here next winter when case numbers start going up again. So you have a reliable source of information. Um, but right now, during the months of February, March, and April, um, donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled up to a potential donation of $40,000 to the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene um, included in these funds. Um, will be scholarships for the annual meeting travel awards for the 2022 meeting in Seattle, Washington, and priority for the scholarships will be placed on females from low and middle income countries who might not otherwise be able to attend. 
Time for some questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. Dominic writes, your podcasts have been very helpful. Once the pandemic is over, would it be possible for you to do a monthly podcast to cover clinical aspects of a chosen infectious disease? Microbe TV is fantastic, but often it focuses on details that my 80 to 90 work week doesn't <laughs> permit. You could bring in hardcore research in a manner that is more clinically relevant and have Vincent ask the critical questions that reinforce the scientific nature of the podcast. Thank you, Dr. Griffin, for bringing material that helps my patients and you, Dr. Racaniello, for creating a hardcore research form that has been sorely needed. So this is perfect. This is like a plug, Vincent, for um, <laughs> next next month. We'll announce it now. Um, we're going to be resurrecting the PUSCast. I don't know if our listeners are familiar with Mark Chrislap's um, podcast, uh, Persif Flagler's PUSCast. Um, he stopped doing it. We reached out to Mark, and he has asked us to, well, allowed us to pick up the reins. Um, and uh, Sarah, who people may remember, Sarah Dong from Febrile, Another podcast she was on this week in parasitism starting next month, once a month, Sarah and I, and Vincent's going to be involved as well, are going to be going through the new scientific infectious disease literature, really targeting clinicians. And then we're going to make sure each month we take one of those articles and do a little bit of a deeper dive into what's the current um, area. So yes, we we are going to answer this email with a new podcast, a resurrected podcast, which will fire up in April. Lisa writes, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner who lives in Southwest Florida. It's not been the easiest place for those of us who believe in science to ride out this pandemic. A recent weekend visit to New York City was like a refreshing trip to another planet, one in which masks and vaccines were not only encouraged, but required and where it was easy to stop on a street corner for a COVID test. A few days ago, our governor berated some high school students standing behind him at a press conference for wearing masks. He asked, not in the nicest tone of voice, for these students to remove them, saying masks were ridiculous and COVID theater. Today, I read that our Surgeon General is going to recommend against COVID vaccines for healthy pediatric patients. I'm curious as to your thoughts on these actions by our state leaders. And yes, that is a flippant question, as my guess is you find them as frustratingly ridiculous as I do. Thanks for all the work you do. Yeah, you know, I I saw that video, uh, Vincent. I don't know if you watched that interaction, um, but I, I was bothered by it. I mean, I, I try to keep my opinions out of this. I try to provide um, education, knowledge, um, so that people can make their own decisions. Um, I really try to respect the decisions that parents and their children make together. So what I'm sort of surprised by this is there's always this rhetoric about, you know, freedom, let people make their own choices. And when those kids went to school that morning, I'm assuming there was a discussion with the parents that, you know, that decision to wear the mask or not is that child's, it's their parents, it's their family's decision. Um, yeah, I, I thought that that was um, upsetting, that dynamic there. And I'm certainly upset with recommendations that go contrary to the science and that don't actually involve um, the best um, education, the best science, the best recommendations for our children. Erica writes, I'm a medical practitioner in Australia, fully vaccinated and boosted. I've heard of a few medical colleagues refusing to be vaccinated because of their concern about the mRNA vaccine causing subclinical and ongoing myocardial scarring, leading to increased risk of cardiac morbidity and death. Are you able to discuss the risk of this complication, please? Yeah, no, no, certainly. And, and really, as I think has been clearly borne out, you are making an active decision to either get vaccinated or to get infected. And getting vaccinated, your risk of cardiac damage is so much lower, logs lower. Um, getting infected, you're actually talking about a real risk of cardiac scarring, a risk of pulmonary scarring, a risk of neurological impact, a risk of death, hospitalization, long COVID. Yeah, getting infected is not the safe option in any context. And finally, from Roy, thank you for your clinical updates. They're amazing. My mother, 78 years old, has multiple comorbidities from six to nine, depending on how one counts them. I've been very careful with her for the past two years, physical distancing, mask, outdoor ventilation, HEPA filters, et cetera. She's fully vaccinated, including all other vaccinations. 
Now people are speaking of normal life. How can I protect her? Should I protect her? What is her risk if she goes back to completely normal socialization, i.e. no mask, no ventilation, no physical distance? Yeah, I mean, this this is tough, right? When when people get up and they say, hey, be reassured, those people that are, are dying after vaccination, they're old, they've got multiple comorbidities. Well, you're sitting here like I am with people I care about saying, well, I'm not okay with that. So the big thing that we can um, recommend right up front is have you shelled, right? If this is a, an individual who may not be able to get that that uh, protection from active vaccination, look into whether or not they qualify. It sounds like this person is a high-risk individual, might actually qualify for that. Um, and then it's going to continue to be smart decisions about um, wearing masks that protect them, making decisions about you know when it's appropriate or safe or um, you know makes the right risk benefit uh, to dine indoors versus dining outdoors. Um, you know, for the last two years, we've actually been. Um, I'd say sort of nice as a society to individuals that are higher risk. And now we've sort of decided that we're kind of done with that. So no, this is challenging, but go ahead, talk to the, talk to the physician. What are the different things um, that might be helpful? And then know about access to therapy. Um, you know, if your loved one gets sick, tests positive, know how do they access that Paxlovid? What medicines are they on that might be a problem? What's their kidney function? Um, maybe monoclonals is a choice as well. So we do have tools. Um, and I think that it's really important to have that discussion. So this person can have the best potential outcome should they have um, infection. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 105 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you so much, and everyone be safe.